Hello, I'm Robert George, McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton University and founder of the American Principles Project. I'm your host for Candidate Conversations. Candidate Conversations features in-depth, one-on-one conversations with 2016 presidential candidates on the important issues of moral and constitutional principle facing American Catholics and our fellow citizens today. My conversation partner today is Senator Ted Cruz. Senator, it's good to be with you. Professor George, it's great to be with you as well. Well, you've called me Professor George before because in full disclosure, uh, uh, Senator Cruz was my student at, uh, at, at Princeton, a star student, I should add, at uh, Princeton. I'm very proud to see him running for President of the United States. Well, well, thank you, Robbie. It's been, a, been an amazing journey, and, and you and I have known each other uh, more than half of my life now. Oh. Uh, yeah. uh, Ted, let's begin with a general question, but I think an important one. What are the principles and institutions of our civilization that you believe are the pillars of our civilization? Are those principles under assault today, and if so, by whom? And what can we do to protect them or rebuild them? Well, I think they are very much under assault. You know, if you look at the American miracle, and uh, you know, as we were talking about a minute ago, when you were my professor in college, we spent a lot of time talking about the Constitution and the founding and the Bill of Rights and, and the extraordinary miracle that formed formed this country. And, and America was really founded on two revolutionary ideas. The first was that our rights come from God, that they don't come from kings or queens or monarchs, which for millennia, that's what, what, what men and women had been told, is, is that the monarch gives rights like crumbs from the table and they can be taken away at the whim of the government. And, and our nation began instead saying, as, as the Declaration put it, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That notion was, was a revolutionary notion, that our rights begin with God and are given to the people, and it's, it's related to the second major miracle at the founding of this country, which is that the framers inverted the concept of sovereignty. For most of mankind's history, we had been told sovereignty likewise comes from the top down. It comes from the ruler. The framers began with the proposition that sovereignty begins with we the people, that the people retain sovereignty, and, and the Constitution, as Jefferson put it, was created to be chains to bind the mischief of government. Those were both revolutionary and extraordinary ideas. And what it resulted in was the freest and most prosperous nation the world has ever seen. A, a land where people like your ancestors and my ancestors could come and achieve everything. So when you look at what are the foundations of our country, I believe the foundations of our country are the free market principles and the constitutional liberties of free citizens to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, to pursue their natural God-given rights. And those foundations are profoundly under assault. Our, our, our natural rights, we have a federal government that, that, that is daily assaulting life, is assaulting marriage, is assaulting religious liberty, which is the first liberty protected in the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. And as you know, the framers referred to religious liberty as our first liberty. And by the federal government, I assume you don't mean simply the executive branch, uh, but the judiciary as well. And, uh, the Congress. It, it, it is a wholesale assault from Washington. It has gotten worse and worse and worse. We've seen the courts. We, ha we have an activist Supreme Court that is disregarding the law and the Constitution. But we've also seen an executive. You know, one of the most troubling aspects of the Obama presidency has been the lawlessness of this administration. That, that we have executive orders, for example, is that what you have in mind? E executive orders, but also a willingness to simply defy the law, to, to, to say if the president disagrees with the law, you know, you take Obamacare. It's a disastrous public policy. It's hurt millions of Americans. But the Obama administration over and over again has just issued orders saying we're going to exempt, for example, members of Congress from Obamacare. It's fundamentally wrong. We're going to exempt giant businesses. We're going to delay this provision or that provision. Under the Constitution, as you know, the President has a duty, a responsibility to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That's the oath he swears. Uh, and we have never seen a President who so brazenly 
declares the authority to say if he disagrees with the law, he will not follow it, he will change it. You know, and by a law, I'm going to interrupt to just yeah, ask, yeah. Uh, I'm assuming uh, you don't necessarily mean an edict of the court. You mean a law actually right. passed by the right. Congress of the United States and signed into law either by yeah, him right. himself as president or by a previous president. I, I, th that is exactly what the law is in our country, is, is there statutes passed through Congress, signed by the president. You can find them in the United States Code. That is the law along with the Constitution. So there's, there's a, an infringement of the principle of the separation of powers, which is one of the key principles of the Constitution for protecting our liberties. That, that is exactly right. You know, a, a, a classic example is the president's approach to ex executive amnesty. A couple of years ago, activists came to him and said, Mr. President, will you grant amnesty to people who are here illegally? And his response was, he said, I can't. It's against the law. It's against federal immigration law. And he said, I well, he am was right not about that. an emperor. Yeah. And then just a few months later, as the election was approaching, he did exactly the thing he said he had no constitutional authority or legal authority to do. Apparently, he became an emperor. And, and, and that is a dangerous thing. Whether you agree or disagree with the policies of Barack Obama, if you've got a president that gets to pick and choose which laws to follow and which laws to ignore, you no longer have a president. The entire constitutional structure was based on the notion that no man is above the law, and if the president doesn't have to follow the law, what's the point of having a Congress, having the people have sovereignty if, if the president can choose what laws he will recognize and what laws he will ignore. You served in President Bush's administration. Mm -hmm. Did President Bush do the same thing with his signing statements? Would he be guilty of the same offense in your view? You know, most presidents have pressed the bounds. And, and abuse of executive power is not, is not a new sin or original sin to the Obama administration. But the extent of it, the brazenness of it, is unique to Obama. You know, in the prior Congress, I was the ranking member on the Constitution Subcommittee uh, of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And, and, and in that capacity, we put out a series of reports chronicling the, the lawlessness of the Obama administration. We outlined, for example, 76 lawless actions. We outlined some of the positions that the Obama Justice Department has taken in front of the United States Supreme Court, some of the radical positions in favor of government power where they've lost 9-0 over and over and over again. So, for example, they argued in one case that law enforcement can place a GPS on any American citizen's car with no probable cause, no articulable suspicion, but it can just go and place a GPS on your car right now parked outside. It sounds like a Fourth Amendment violation. Well, and the Supreme Court agreed. Unanimously, the Supreme Court rejected the Obama Justice Department's position. They said the Fourth Amendment said nothing whatsoever about the government placing GPSs on people's cars. Likewise... Well, I'm, I'm going to have to move on to the next question, but, but I get the point. I take and the let point. me briefly give you one more question, sure. because mm -hmm. it will be one you will, you will know and care about. In, in, in the case of Hosanna Tabor... Oh, yes, religious liberty case. Religious liberty case. The Obama administration went before the Supreme Court and argued that the Constitution says nothing about whether priests and pastors and rabbis have the right to choose who they will hire and fire in their own church, about when a church is hiring a, pe a priest or pastor or a rabbi. The Obama administration said the First Amendment does not protect the authority of your church to determine who the priest is. That was a shocking position that the administration took, I agree. And Elena Kagan, who had been the Solicitor General under President Obama, who was appointed to the court by Barack Obama, she leaned over the bench and said to the Obama Justice Department, I find your position astonishing. Yes, astonishing <laughs> is judicial speak for outrageous. And unanimously yeah. the Supreme Court rejected that. They've had a pattern of ignoring our constitutional liberties. I think it's really dangerous. Uh, Ted, the 14th Amendment says that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, mm -hmm. nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now the amendment in its fifth section includes a provision that delegates to the Congress the power, and I quote, to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Yep. Now, do you believe that unborn babies are persons within the meaning of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment? And if so, will you call on Congress to use its authority under the 14th mm -hmm. Amendment, pursuant to Section 5, to protect the unborn? Mm -hmm. Or do you take the view, as some do, that uh, we can't do that until mm -hmm. Roe versus Wade is 
overturned either by the court mm -hmm. itself or by constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on that? Uh, listen, absolutely yes. Um, I, I think the first obligation of, of everyone uh, in public office is to protect life. Life is foundational. In, in fact, as you look at, at, at the declaration, the, the, that ordering of, of unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, I think is a very deliberate ordering. W without yeah. life, there is no liberty, and without liberty, there is no pursuit of happiness. That, that each builds upon the other. And, and I very much agree that with, with the Pope's long-standing and, and prior Pope's before him's long-standing call to protect every human life from the moment of conception to the moment of natural death. And we can do that by congressional action Ab absolutely yes. without waiting for the Supreme Court to overturn Will uh, versus Wade. Uh, absolutely yes, under the 14th Amendment. And you know, we've seen, uh, you know, this is an issue where, where a lot of candidates talk about being pro-life, but, but my view as a voter is, is, is I'm interested in, in have you walked the walk? You know, the Bible talks about you shall know them by their fruits. You know, what is your record? You know, when I was the Solicitor General of Texas, the chief lawyer for the state in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, over and over again we defended the right to life. So, for example, we defended the federal partial birth abortion ban, went to the Supreme Court, and we won 5-4. We defended New Hampshire's parental notification law. We went to the Supreme Court, and we won unanimously. And when the Texas state legislature passed a law prohibiting taxpayer funds from going to Planned Parenthood, going to organizations that, that provide abortions, a federal district court struck that law down. And I personally argued the case in the Court of Appeals, and we won unanimously reinstating that law. And, and you know, Robbie, we saw this come really to a head just a few weeks ago. With the, uh, with the uh, pain-capable Well, that... both with the pain-capable bill banning abortion, of late-term late abortion, abortion after 20 weeks, but also with the fight over Planned Parenthood. And, and, and it, the funding issue. Yes, and, and, it, and it was really, I think, a, a seminal moment. You know, if you remember the second Republican primary debate uh, that was in California, where, where just about every candidate looked in the TV cameras and said, we should stop Planned Parenthood, we should defund them. And, and then just a couple of weeks later, here in Washington, we had a knockdown, drag-out fight on exactly that issue. And, and millions of Americans rose up and said, stop funding Planned Parenthood. These videos are horrific. They're, they're heart-wrenching. They show the barbarity of, of what Planned Parenthood is doing. And, and I was proud to lead that fight to stop taxpayer funding for Planned Parenthood. And I have to say, of the other Republican candidates, they're all good men and women, but they were nowhere to be found. In that fight, when the fight was happening, can you imagine how differently that would have played out? if every Republican candidate had descended on Washington and it stood in unison and said, Mitch McConnell and John Boehner, don't give $500 million of taxpayer funds to Planned Parenthood. It would have changed the entire battle. And I think that's one of the reasons so many conservatives are uniting behind my campaign, because people are, are tired of just campaign rhetoric. They want to see someone who's walking the walk and is fighting to defend life. And I have spent many, many years doing exactly that, and as president, that's exactly what I'll do. Let me ask you an important uh, question about yeah. judicial power. Yeah. Uh, now, no one denies that sometimes the Supreme Court gets the Constitution wrong. Yes. They're not infallible. <laughs> as, uh, as one of your competitors says, they're the Supreme Court, not the Supreme Being. Uh, they were certainly wrong in the Dred Scott decision, which uh, pro uh, prohibited Congress from yeah. banning slavery in the federal uh, territories. They were wrong to overturn worker protection mm -hmm. legislation in 1905 in Lochner against New York. And then they were, again, yeah. tragically yeah. wrong in Roe versus Wade in 1973, uh, creating the abortion uh, license. And, and now this year they've done it again, mm -hmm. another tragic mistake yeah. yes. in imposing same-sex marriage on the entire country in its decision in Obergefell mm -hmm. versus uh, Hodges. So my question is going to be about how a president or senator right. should respond to the Supreme Court when it usurps yep. the authority yep. of the people and their elected representatives by issuing edicts that lack any yep. warrant in the text or logic or original yeah. Yeah. understanding of the Constitution. And I want to make this question really quite specific, right. Senator. Right. Some people say that a president must always accept the court's interpretation of the Constitution, no matter how dubious that interpretation is, that we have to treat it as the law of the land, binding not just on the parties to the case, mm -hmm. but on other officials of government, beginning with the president. 
Abraham Lincoln, though, yep. as you know, yes. vehemently disagreed with that idea of judicial supremacy, saying that to treat unconstitutional court rulings as binding mm -hmm. in all cases, mm -hmm. no matter what, right. no matter how usurpative, no matter how anti-constitutional, mm -hmm. would be for the American people, and I quote, quote now the great emancipator, yeah. Yeah. to resign their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. Mm -hmm. And Lincoln, of course, acted on this belief. He, exactly. he pursued legislation and signed into law legislation that restricted uh, slavery in the federal territories. He issued passports and patents to mm -hmm. black citizens mm -hmm. who, under, under uh, Dred Scott against Sanford, right, right. could not even be citizens. The Supreme yep. Court said yep. even free blacks couldn't yep. be yep. citizens. Uh, was Lincoln right mm -hmm. to defy the court mm -hmm. on that? And would you as president do that with the Obergefell decision? Mm -hmm. Lincoln was absolutely right. I agree with President Lincoln. And courts do not make law. That is not what a court does. A court interprets the law, a court applies the law, but courts don't make law. And, you know, this is an area of really striking divide in this presidential election. One candidate, Hillary Clinton, agrees with the court and embraces gay marriage and is happy that unelected judges have purported to tear down the marriage laws of all 50 states. On the Republican side, there are quite a few Republicans who, when the gay marriage decision came down, they described it as the settled law of the land. It's final. We must accept it, move on, and surrender. Uh, those are almost word for words Barack Obama's talking points, and, and I think they are profoundly wrong. I think the decision was fundamentally legitimate. It was lawless. It was not based on the Constitution. I, I agree very much with Justice Scalia, who wrote a powerful dissent saying this decision is a fundamental threat to our democracy. It is five unelected judges declaring themselves the rulers of 320 million Americans. And indeed, Justice Scalia, in the penultimate paragraph of his dissent, predicts, hearkening back to President Lincoln defying Dred Scott, that state and local officials will refuse to obey this lawless decision. It's remarkable to see a Supreme Court justice saying that will be the consequence of this. And, you know, we really saw the height of the arrogance of the court just a few weeks ago when Justice Kennedy was at the Harvard Law School and he was oh. asked a question by students about this decision. And his response, he compared the Supreme Court of the United States to the Nazis. And he said, how many judges do you think defied the Third Reich? And with a smile, he holds up his fingers and says three. And it was a stunning statement, Robbie, for a sitting Supreme Court justice. This isn't me calling them the Nazis. This is Justice Kennedy calling the court on which he serves, calling the opinion that he wrote, analogizing that to the Nazi decrees that we must obey. That is an arrogance. It is an elitism. It is being out of touch with our nation. And, and I'll point just, out... Just to be clear, surely Justice Kennedy was not embracing Nazism. I, I, he drew the analogy. And he's, it, the obvious implication was, just as you're forced to obey the Nazis, you're forced to obey us as well. Um, the law is the law. And if you don't like even, the law... Even you... if we are tyrannical and oppressive. Now, yeah. now, look, certainly he wasn't embracing all of the horrible things the Nazis did, but, but to make that analogy, that is essentially saying, we wear the jackboot, and you must obey us. That is not the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution. And, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example that, uh, that may surprise you on this issue, uh, which is a number of weeks ago I went on the, on the Stephen Colbert show. <laughs> that does surprise me. Okay. <laughs> um, not a friendly place for conservatives, to put it mildly. And, you know, the first few minutes we were yucking it up and having fun, and it, was pretty, it went all right. Uh, and then Colbert, who's very politically liberal, immediately leaps into gay marriage. And, and my response, I said, Stephen, I'm, I'm a constitutionalist. Under the Constitution, marriage is a question for the states. And the audience, which leans very heavily left, began booing. And, and a bunch of newspaper reporters wrote headlines, you know, Colbert audience boos Cruz. What's interesting is they didn't write what happened afterwards. So Colbert, and I'll give him credit for this, he asked the audience, look, please be respectful. He's my guest. Let's hear him out. And, and his response, he turned to me and he said, but Ted, marriage is found nowhere in the Constitution. Oh, he doesn't have the theory of the Constitution <laughs> at all. If it's not found in the Constitution, it's left to the states in the democratic process. A and you would be pleased to know that I remembered my constitutional law class from Professor George. <laughs> and my response was, Stephen, 
Exactly. If it's not in the Constitution, under the Tenth Amendment, it's left to the states. And, and then I turned to the audience and I said, look, y'all may agree or disagree on the policy of gay marriage, but why would you want every public policy issue of the day decided by five unelected lawyers who are accountable to nobody? If you care about an issue, how about convincing your brothers and sisters, convincing your neighbors, convincing 320 million Americans, win at the ballot box? That's called democracy. And the amazing thing, Robbie, the crowd burst into applause, and the applause was much louder than the boos. Even in a left-leaning Democratic audience, democracy and empowering the people instead of philosopher kings on the court resonates and it's powerful because it's who we are as Americans. But it shows us just how poorly so many people understand our constitutional yes. system. They don't understand that the default position really is democracy. Yeah. Here the people rule. And judges can intervene not when they simply disagree with right. what the people right. do, but only when there's a an actual warrant for it in the text of the Constitution or its logic or structure or mm -hmm. original understanding. That, that, that is absolutely right. And, and as you know, this has been a passion of mine. Since you were a student, yes, that's You know, right. back yeah. from when I was a teenager, indeed, uh, you know, I wrote my senior thesis under your supervision on the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, on the limitations of the federal government to protect the authority of the people. And, and uh, you know, I have to say, I think those, those principles have never been more under assault than they are right now. Yeah, and in part because, as your experience on the Colbert Show uh, shows, people don't understand them. It's not that they reject right. them. Uh, in fact, if they applauded when you gave them a little lesson about it, right. that shows that it's not that they have heard about the Constitution and reject it. It's that They've they actually heard. haven't heard about the Constitution. They have a false image of it. Well, and it's something is. we need leaders who can stand up and speak the truth with a smile, yeah. with a loving spirit, but with a smile. Now, now I, I, I do have to tell one story of back when I was a student <laughs> um, where, where I had submitted one of my junior papers to you. Um, which, which uh, as you know, your junior papers are a big, big part of your grade. It's a big part of graduating. And, and I got the junior paper back, and you had folded the corner the, of the front page over. And uh oh, you, and I'm you, remembering this. <laughs> <laughs> and you had written C. Plus. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and, and I held the paper with the super seriousness of a 19-year-old who was convinced, you know, they talk about your life flashing before your yes, eyes as right, I'm yeah. sitting there convinced I'm your not going to get into grad school. school. All, yeah. all of that is fa falling over. My knuckles are white, and then I flip the corner over, and it says, just kidding, A. <laughs> yeah, that was rather cruel of me, and I should probably apologize uh, in front of our audience here for, uh, for that. Uh, it, 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 it made an indelible impression. But you deserved an A. You deserved an A, and you got an A. Well, I, 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 I appreciate it, and it got my attention, too. <laughs> good, it got your attention. Well, good. Professors often have trouble getting students' attention, but I'm glad it got yours. Uh, Ted, I want to move on to religious liberty, a very, very important issue, and uh, the viewers of this uh, broadcast are going to be extremely interested, of course, in hearing what you and the other candidates have to say. Uh, our bishops, the Catholic bishops, mm -hmm. have expressed really a deep concern yes. about religious liberty, yes. especially the emerging efforts to punish people for believing that yes. marriage is the union of husband yes. and wife yes. and for acting on that yes. belief in leading their uh, lives. Mm -hmm. Catholics, Evangelicals, yes. Eastern Orthodox Christians, yeah. Mormons, yeah. Orthodox Jews, it's really people of lots of different right. traditional right. faiths, have been penalized mm -hmm. or f even fired right. from government right. jobs. Our adoption agencies, mm -hmm. Catholics, yes. Lutherans, and others, have been excluded from helping orphan children, which many of them had done for yeah. yep. decades yep. and decades yep. very successfully because they want to place children with a mom and a dad and a home with a mom and a dad. Mm -hmm. Small business owners have faced bankrupting fines from yep. government. Yep for declining to facilitate same-sex mm -hmm. ceremonies mm -hmm. by providing uh, artistic uh, services mm -hmm. as photographers, for example, mm -hmm. or, or providing um, uh, catering, baking, and so right. forth. Now, in that powerful dissent that Chief Justice Roberts wrote mm -hmm. in Obergefell, the mm -hmm. same-sex marriage decision, he warned, and I'm going to quote him here for you, the Solicitor General, the Obama Administration's yes. Solicitor yes. General, candidly acknowledged that the tax exemptions of some religious institutions would be in question if they opposed same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. There is little doubt that these and similar questions will soon be forced on this court. Unfortunately, this is Chief Justice yeah. Roberts yeah. speaking, people of faith can take no comfort in the treatment they receive from the majority on this court mm -hmm. today." Mm -hmm. unquote. Mm -hmm. Well, given the seriousness of these yeah. religious yeah. liberty threats, what would you do as President of the United mm -hmm. States 
to protect the rights of Christians and others here, right, really right. people of all sure, faiths. This sure, is not just, sure. just Christians, Jews, Muslims, yeah, people yeah. of all faiths who believe in marriage right, as a union right. of man and a woman. And specifically, mm -hmm. would you, in your first hundred days, push for the passage of the First Amendment Defense Act, the FATA Act, mm -hmm. that would protect mm -hmm. people's rights uh, against any possible discrimination from the federal government or persecution, mm -hmm. people's rights to believe right. and act on their belief that marriage is the union of husband and wife. Mm -hmm. So absolutely yes, and, and as you know, I'm an original sponsor of that legislation. And, and, and when it comes to religious liberty, religious liberty has been a passion for me for decades. And, and it has been something that, that I have been fighting to defend for many, many years. When, when I was the Solicitor General of Texas, we defended the Ten Commandments monument that stands on the state capitol grounds. We went to the U.S. Supreme Court and we won 5-4, upholding the public display of the Ten Commandments, changed the judicial interpretation all across the country. We defended the Pledge of Allegiance. You'll remember when an atheist sued seeking to strike down the pledge. Michael Newdow yes. wanted to take under God out yeah. of the pledge. And we defended those words, one nation under God. We went to the Supreme Court and we won unanimously. President Lincoln's words yeah. at Gettysburg. And then likewise, when I was in private practice, I represented over three million veterans, pro bono for free, mm -hmm. defending the Mojave Desert Veterans Memorial, which is a lone white Latin cross. It was erected over 70 years ago to honor the men and women that gave their lives in World War I. And the ACLU sued seeking to get that Veterans Memorial torn down. They won in the district court, they won in the Court of Appeals. The court ordered that Veterans Memorial to be covered with a giant sack with a chain and a padlock at the bottom because they said you cannot gaze at the image of a cross on public lands. And we went to the Supreme Court on, on behalf of three million veterans defending that Veterans Memorial and we won 5-4. I mean, this has been a life's passion fighting for it, and, and I'm convinced 2016 is going to be a religious liberty election. You know, I've hosted now two religious liberty rallies, one in Iowa, one in South Carolina. They both had two, 3,000 people come out. And what we did, you know, the media tries so hard to belittle these threats. They say they're not real, they don't exist. Oh, well, I could name names, and yeah. I'm sure you could too, of the people who've yes. been persecuted, beginning with mm. Kelvin Cochran down yes. in Atlanta, the fire chief, yes. who lost his job for his private expression of his belief in the biblical understanding of marriage. Uh, you, you are exactly right. And so what we did at these two rallies, you know, typically at a political event, the candidate's front and center. Mm -hmm. I very much wanted me to recede. In fact, I just sat sat in, in the audience and listened, and we featured heroes. So Kelvin Cochran spoke at Is our Iowa yeah, Religious there. Liberty Rally. We had nine heroes come, come to Iowa and just tell their stories. And, and, and it was ordinary people, a, a, a baker, a florist, a fireman, a soldier, every one of whom stood for their faith and every one of whom was persecuted. We did another one in South Carolina, and, and it was uplifting. It was powerful. You know, I would encourage your viewers We've got both religious liberty rallies on our website, which is tedcruz.org. I would encourage folks, go to the website, tedcruz.org, and watch it. It will lift your spirits. You know, in South Carolina, uh, a young girl spoke, Angela Hildenbrand. She's a, a senior in college right now. Four years ago, uh, she was the valedictorian of her high school class in San Antonio. She's Catholic. And she was preparing her valedictory speech, and someone had filed litigation, afraid that they would pray at her graduation. And a federal court issued a temporary restraining order ordering Angela not to pray. So it was a preemptive yes. strike yes. against her exercising her First Amendment freedom of speech right to say a prayer. <laughs> and the order specified if she said the words God, Jesus, prayer, or amen, she would be thrown in jail. The order also explicitly exempted that if student wa students wanted to, to kneel down and pray towards Mecca, they could do so. But you could not say Jesus. And, and think about this for a second. A 17-year-old high school senior, what should be the proudest day, or one of the proudest days of her life, and she's facing a choice. Does she refuse to acknowledge God, or does she go to jail? And... Thankfully, she filed an emergency appeal in the Court of Appeals, and they reversed that decision, and she stood in her valedictory speech and offered a prayer of thanksgiving. But those are the assaults we're seeing. And we are seeing it, Ted. Uh, the, um, the crazy thing, really, about yeah. it, when you think about it, is 
Uh, here's this young woman, mm -hmm. just exercising her basic yeah. rights as an American citizen, a free human being, yeah. to pray. Yeah. Not forcing it right. on anyone. No one else right. is being forced right. to, to pray. They're going to listen, but yeah. they can say what they want as well when it's their turn. But every session of the Congress in which you serve is opened with a prayer. Yeah. And indeed, every session of the Supreme Court of the United States is opened not only with a prayer, but with an invocation of... God, God. <laughs> God save the United States and, and this, this honorable, honorable court. court. Yeah. And more than once I've wondered if that should be rephrased, God save the United States from this honorable <laughs> court. Uh, Senator, the Obama administration has issued a new ruling requiring every public school in the United States to give biological males who say that they are psychologically female access to girls' showers, bathrooms, and dressing areas. The administration threatens school districts, like one in Illinois, yeah, yeah. with the loss of federal funding yes, if they yes. refuse to comply with this. Hundreds of girls and boys yeah. walked out, yes. actually, of yeah. one school, Hillsborough High School in Hillsborough, um, Missouri, to protest this invasion of yeah. their yeah. privacy. This new uproar is happening at a time when many other parents are already upset mm -hmm. by the way federal funding is used, manipulated, to change the curriculum in their states, some 46 states. This is the so-called Common Core. Yeah with little input from parents. So what will you as president do to guarantee that federal funding will not be used, right. won't right. be weaponized, right. yeah. to force school yeah. districts to require girls to shower yeah. with boys or undress with boys? And what else will you do to stem the growing misuse of regulations, yeah. not just funding, testing, for example, mm -hmm. and funding, of yeah. course? Uh, and what will you do to restore to parents mm -hmm. and to local communities yes. the control that, under the Constitution, they are supposed to have of their right. children's education. Right. Well, look, th this is ridiculous. It shows just how radical and extreme the current administration is. You know, you know, I'm the father of two little girls. Caroline and Catherine are seven and five. I don't want my daughters taking showers with little boys. I don't want them when they're in junior high or high school. And it's absurd. No, no parents do. Yeah. And, and, and these, are, these are zealots. Yesterday, I chaired a hearing the Judiciary Committee where the acting head of the Civil Rights Division refused to disagree with this proposition. She was, she was asked, is the Justice Department going to begin persecuting school districts that say little boys and little girls don't have to shower together? And she refused to answer those questions. It, it is radical and extreme. Now, you asked what we should do about it. We should do a number of things about it. Number one, I've pledged, if I'm elected president, that in the opening days I will direct the Department of Education that Common Core ends today. The Obama administration has used race to the top funds, has used federal power to bludgeon the states into adopting Common Core. That will end if I'm elected president. Beyond that, when it comes to the Department of Education, I think we should abolish the Federal Department of Education. Education is too important for it to be dictated by unelected bureaucrats in Washington. Instead, we should block grant that money, send it to the states. It ought to be at the state and local governments where parents have direct control. You know, if it was the local school board that was insisting little boys and little girls shower together, the parents would be in an uproar, the school board would be thrown out almost immediately, and it would never happen. The, the Constitution would be working. Exactly. Yeah. That's the, the democratic process. When, when decisions are made by unelected bureaucrats in Washington, they don't care what the parents think about yeah. their kids. It doesn't, and, and that disconnect is profoundly harmful. And, you know, likewise, on, on religious liberty, we were talking about a minute ago. I have promised, if I'm elected president, on the very first day that I'm in office, I will direct the United States Department of Justice and the IRS and every federal agency that the persecution of religious liberty ends today. And it has been the abuse of executive power where Obama has committed his most egregious offenses. The silver lining of that is everything done with executive power. Can be undone. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Senator, the Catholic Church teaches uh, what we call the preferential option for the poor. And basically, that uh, understanding is that uh, when it comes to any proposed policy, yeah, the first yeah. thing we should ask about it is, what will its impact likely be yes. on the weakest, yes. most vulnerable yes. members of our community, the unborn, to be sure, mm -hmm. physically right. or mentally uh, handicapped or disabled people, mm -hmm. and those who are mired uh, in poverty? 
Now, it's true, of course, that uh, sometimes uh, policies that help the best off or the, those who are already well off also help the poor by elevating general prosperity and providing very valuable, needed employment opportunities. Sure. But are there things that you specifically would do mm -hmm. to help the poor and the middle class yeah. in this country? Uh, absolutely. And, and, and let me start with first principles and then go to specifics. The reason I am a conservative is because I believe the American free enterprise system has been the greatest engine for freedom and prosperity the world has ever seen. And, and indeed, I've, I've described my political philosophy as what I call opportunity conservatism, which is that every issue we look at, we should look at through a Rawlsian lens. We should look at how does it impact the least off among us. Well, Professor Rawls <laughs> did say that. You're absolutely right. Uh, uh, but um, those of us who are Catholics like to think that uh, the church actually said it first. <laughs> I, no, no, no doubt. No, no doubt. And, and it's the right focus. How does it impact young people and Hispanics and African Americans and single moms? And in particular, how does it help people ease the means of ascent up the economic ladder? And, and I think the basic difference between left and right is we both look at the socioeconomic ladder. The left believes you can reach down, physically grab people and move them up. And it's usually out of noble intentions. They want to help. The problem is it never, ever, ever works. The only way people have ever ascended the economic ladder is to pull themselves up one rung at a time. So every policy, I believe, should encourage individual responsibility and empowerment to climb the economic ladder. You know, I look at a lot of this, in fact, all of this, really through the lens of my dad. Yeah, my, my father fled Cuba in 1957. He'd been in prison. He was tortured in Cuba as a teenager. And, and, and when he came to America, he was 18, and he couldn't speak English. He had $100 that was sewn into his underwear. And he got a job. He washed dishes, making 50 cents an hour. And he worked full time. He paid his way through school. And he went on to start a small business with my mom. Today, my dad's a pastor. He travels the country preaching the gospel. I've said many times, thank God some well-meaning liberal didn't come put his arm around my dad when he was a teenage kid washing dishes. Thank God that he didn't say, here's a government check. Let me make you dependent on government. Let me sap your self-respect, your individual dignity, your sense of responsibility. And by the way, I respect your culture so much, don't bother learning English. I'm going to keep you trapped out of the educated and professional classes in this country. That would have been utterly destructive. You are not doing anyone a favor by trapping them in dependency. And in my view, the social safety net should be a trampoline and not a hammock. But you do believe in a safety net? A absolutely, yes. Listen, everyone falls... So this isn't a libertarian, uh, um, dog eat dog um, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't defame the libertarian. Many libertarians don't have that view, but there's a, right. one particular form of libertarianism that's sometimes associated with what's called social Darwinism that just says, well, look, the government just doesn't have any business even providing a safety net. But you think the government does. That is absolutely not my position. I think the, the goal of the social safety net should be to get people back on their feet. From the instance, everyone falls on hard times. People need, need help. You know, in my family, I come from a family where a lot of members of my family are single moms. My sister was a single mom. Both my aunts were single moms. My mother was a single mom for a period of time when, when, when I was very young and my dad left us. Uh, now, thankfully, he became a Christian and he came yeah. back and, and, and restored our family. But people fall on hard times. But you look at one of the most successful public policy revolutions of modern times, it was in the mid-90s, welfare reform. When Republicans took over Congress and, and fought Bill Clinton and managed to pass welfare reform, he vetoed it over and over again. Eventually they passed it. And all the liberal newspaper writers said millions of people are going to be thrown into the streets, they're going to starve, this is terrible. What it did is it required people on welfare to seek work or go to work, and it had an incredible impact. It lifted millions of people out of poverty that, where they went and got jobs. It transformed their lives. And, and we need to do that. The focus of every federal welfare program should be getting people back into the workplace, providing for their families, having the dignity of work, the self-respect. And, and I would note one of the most powerful policies with, with, with regard to that is school choice. I am absolutely passionate about school choice. I think it's the civil rights issue of the 21st century. Indeed, I will observe a few years back, I served on Notre Dame's 
Committee, Commission on Catholic Education in the Hispanic Community. Now, as you know, even though I'm Cuban, Irish, and Italian, I, I'm, not, I'm not actually Catholic, I'm, um, which, which, which is a, a curious story in and of itself, but, but I, I was the only Southern Baptist on Notre Dame's Commission on Catholic Education in the Hispanic community, and the reason is the Catholic Church has been so incredible going into disadvantaged communities, providing educational opportunity, transforming the lives of kids. And I think we need to campaign that every child in America, regardless of race or ethnicity or wealth or zip code, deserves access to a quality education. And that is a passion as near and dear to my heart as any, anything there is. Well, that's certainly going to resonate with a lot of uh, our viewers because we do see school choice as uh, an important social mobility enhancing device, uh, really. I mean, if we're going to attack the problem of poverty in this country, education is key, yes. and empowering parents is key. Now, I should also uh, add, Ted, that um, some, um, in my opinion, some of the very best Catholics out there are Southern Baptists. Uh, again, that <laughs> list with my friend Russell Moore. Um, finally, we're a nation of immigrants. You and I are both of immigrant yeah. stock, proudly, yeah. gratefully, mm -hmm. gratefully to this country. Mm -hmm. Uh, because immigration really has been a source of strength not only for the immigrants yes. who get the wonderful yes. benefits of opportunity in this country and liberty in this country, but also for the nation. This nation has benefited enormously. A absolutely. Millions and millions of people have come here, mm -hmm. and not just people who are yeah. well-educated yes. or yes. well-off. Let's remember that many of the people uh, who really have helped to build yeah. Yeah. America's greatness uh, came here with nothing or with a hundred dollars sewn right, into, right, right. A, into yeah, a piece yeah. of clothing or something like that. Many have not been well educated, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. they have made enormous contributions and their children have gone on to be mm -hmm. professionals, right. to be, to go to Princeton and mm -hmm. go to Harvard Law School and to be lawyers and Supreme Court advocates and run for President of the United States. The Catholic uh, bishops have long favored a form of comprehensive, a version of comprehensive immigration reform that would combine a generous welcoming policy for legal uh, immigrants. Uh, and at the same time, humane treatment, not involving mass deportations or the separation of families for people who are here unlawfully. Now, do you agree with the bishops or do you disagree with some aspects of their policy? And how would a Cruz administration yeah. handle the immigration issue? Well, I, I think on immigration, there's actually a lot of bipartisan agreement outside of Washington. I, I think most Americans have, have a lot of common ground on this issue. I think there is overwhelming bipartisan agreement that we have got to get serious about securing the borders and stopping illegal immigration. And I think there is also considerable bipartisan agreement outside of Washington that we should welcome and celebrate legal immigration. You know, Reagan called legal immigrants Americans by choice. And, 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 and my view of it is very simple, which is legal, good, illegal, bad. Uh, I think we can do both. We can have a legal immigration system that benefits America, that serves the American people and our needs and interests, and we can also secure the borders. I've rolled out a very detailed immigration plan. It's on my website, tedcruz.org. You can read chapter and verse the specifics. If I'm elected president, we will secure the border. Actually, existing federal law is quite robust. What federal statutes require, federal statutes require the construction of 700 miles of double-layered fencing on the southern border. President Obama has built 36 miles of it. He's just ignoring the law, refuses to comply with it. Federal law requires a strong biometric exit entry system for visas. Forty percent of illegal immigration is not coming across the border. It's visa overstays. President Obama just refuses to comply with the law. It's on the statute books. The federal government just doesn't do it. If I'm elected president, we will secure the border. We will build a wall that works. We will triple the border patrol. We will use technology. We'll use E-Verify. And we will actually solve the problem. And, and, and let me point out, this is a problem that impacts law enforcement. You know, I represent Texas. There's 1,200 miles of border with Mexico and Texas, and we deal every day with the law enforcement challenges, with criminality, with the national security threats. But securing the border is also a question of humanity. You know, I would invite folks, come down to South Texas and see what is happening there. I've seen photograph after photograph of the bodies of women and children abandoned in the desert. The people smuggling people into these countries, they're not caring social workers. They are hardened criminal cartels 
profiting hugely from the exploitation of, of desperate people. And they're sexually abusing women and children, they're physically abusing women and children, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds are abandoned to die, pregnant women left to die. Nobody who is concerned about compassion and humanity would want to continue a system that continues to incentivize illegal immigration. So you've got a plan for fighting the illegal immigration problem. Uh, are you uh, saying that on the legal immigration front you'll resist the calls of those who are demanding a dramatic decrease in the number of immigrants we accept on the theory that uh, they take jobs from Americans and so forth? Look, I think our top priority needs to be protecting working men and women. And so, so for example, we can re reform legal immigration so that we speed it up, we, we reduce the paperwork, we reduce the bureaucracy. You know, one of the things the Obama administration is doing is it is raiding the funds that legal immigrants pay and using it to fund their illegal amnesty program. And, you know, I'll tell you, just, just a few days ago, I was in the Newark airport, and a gentleman walk up, walked up to me. He was, he was Indian American, from India originally. And, and, and he, said, he said, I'm a physician. He said, I waited 10 years to come to this country. I spent thousands of dollars in legal fees. I came here legally. Thank you for standing and fighting for me. And I think the legal immigrants get forgotten. I get people stopping me all the time saying, look, we followed the rules and it's perfectly consistent with compassion to embrace rule of law. You know, one of the amazing things about Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton who call for amnesty for ignoring our laws for people here illegally, you know, no other nation on earth does that. If you or I entered illegally in France or Germany or China or Mexico, they would deport us. That's what other nations do and, and, and it's a strange notion that apparently they don't think we should respect our laws. And, and I'll tell you, this issue has particular saliency right now. As we look at the terrorist attack that occurred in Paris, which is horrific, uh, and it underscores the threat of radical Islamic terrorism, which sadly neither President Obama nor Hillary Clinton are, are even willing to utter the words radical Islamic terrorism. I am leading the effort to stop President Obama and Hillary Clinton's plan to bring in tens of thousands of Syrian Muslim refugees to America. It doesn't make any sense. If you look at the refugees streaming into Europe right now, one estimate was 77 percent are young men. That is a very unusual demographic for a refugee wave. The Director of National Intelligence here in the United States have said, has said it's clear that among those refugees going into Europe are undoubtedly ISIS terrorists there to wage jihad. Now, we're seeing a humanitarian crisis in the Middle East, but I believe the Syrian Muslim refugees should be resettled in the Middle East, in majority Muslim countries, but I've drawn a distinction, and I know this is an issue very dear to your heart. I've drawn a clear distinction between those refugees and the Christians who are being persecuted. And what we are seeing in the Middle East with Christians being persecuted, ISIS is attempting to carry out genocide on Middle Eastern Christians. They are being crucified. They are being beheaded. And I believe the Christians are in a materially different position and we need to work to provide them a safe haven. It is one of the most shameful things about this administration that it refuses to, to, to hear the cries of the Christians being persecuted. And, and I would note President Obama just this week has attacked me twice for saying we should not be letting in refugees who may be ISIS terrorists, but we should be hearing the pleas of the Christians, he's called that un-American. I think it is the essence of who we are as, as Americans, to be compassionate to everyone, but also to protect our national security, because the attack in Paris, ISIS has made clear they intend to carry out similar t terrorist attacks in the United States, and we shouldn't be letting in people who this administration cannot vet to determine if they're, if they're members of ISIS. ISIS has made good on its threats yes. to carry out terror in Europe, and it has also threatened to carry out terror in the United States, and we have no reason to believe they are not serious and capable yes. of doing it. Uh, Senator, I wish we had more time, especially to per pursue uh, this issue. I know you mm -hmm. draw the distinction between Islamic radical uh, terrorism and, and ordinary Muslims who are good American uh, citizens and who should not be persecuted or discriminated and, against. And in fact, on that point, you know, this summer I wrote a book called A Time for Truth. And, and I, one of the things I do in that book is I, is I profile President Sisi in Egypt, 
who on January 1st of this year in Cairo gave an incredible speech calling out radical Islamic terrorism. Now, that was a courageous speech for President Sisi to give. He is a Muslim. Right. And to stand up to the radical Islamic terrorists, he is ensuring that there is a bounty on his head that they are trying to murder him. It was yeah, courageous. I profile our, our Muslim friends because and, and they are the people is the who are working against Why the, is our uh, president Ethers. not showing the same courage that President Sisi is? President Sisi will call out radical Islamic terrorists, and yet President Obama refuses to do so. Yeah. And, and I think that's really dangerous. I've, I've myself been a critic of uh, Sisi's policies in some other human rights uh, sure, areas, sure. but I do join you in saluting him for being willing to actually name names about what's, hap yes. what's happening here. Hey. Senator, thank you for being with me on Candidate Conversations. Thank you, Robbie. Good. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Senator Cruz for joining me today on Candidate Conversations 2016. And thank you for joining us, and I hope to see you again for the next Candidate Conversations 2016. See you soon.